Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm going to get started uh, so I don't have to talk really fast towards the end, which typically I'll do anyway. Uh, my name is Anders Walgren. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Electric Cloud. Uh, we do uh, DevOps release automation, release orchestration uh, software for, for our customers, you know, typically larger uh, uh, companies with you know, lots and lots of applications, hundreds, thousands, uh, those kinds of things. But uh, you know, we've worked a lot uh, in the kind of DevOps, agile, uh, continuous delivery, continuous integration arena for the last uh, 15 years. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be as bold as to say that I have a few things to say about things like application architectures and pipeline and continuous delivery uh, and those kinds of things. But um, there's a lot of different opinions on this subject, obviously. A little bit of an agenda, just so you know what you're going to see. Um, give some context up front, you know, talk about why software architecture is important. Um, if for no other reason, then I'd want to stop reading headlines pretty much on a daily basis of this was hacked, that was hacked, this privacy was violated, that privacy was violated, you know, those, those kinds of things. I'd like to see those be a little bit less common. Um, and it's going to be kind of dangerous for some companies now that the GDRP, I think I got that right, regulations go into effect in Europe um, because that can be a death sentence for a company if you violate GDRP. Uh, which has a lot to say about privacy. I think you can, you can get sued as a company for 4% of your global revenues uh, if you violate GDRP. I'm not here to talk about GDRP, but that's just one of the reasons why software architecture is important. Um, and I guess I should tell you the rest about it too. I'm gonna talk a little bit about loosely coupled architectures and, and microservices, a little bit about containers, because those are very, you know, very hot topics right now, but also help solve a lot of the problems that we run into. Uh, with software. I'll also talk about why the software pipeline architecture, and what I mean by that is really, you know, how do you get from the developer's laptop to where stuff is in your customer's hands, whatever that means, right? Whether that's a website or a mobile device or an IoT device or, you know, what have you. Um, that, that's an important too. Some resources and stuff and, and hopefully a little bit of time for, uh, for Q&A uh, in, in the beginning. Um, if I talk too fast, if I talk too slow, you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. We, we can make this as interactive as, as we all want it uh, to be. So, some context. Um, software is eating the world, Mark Andreessen famously said in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago. And, and it's kind of true, right? I mean, we, we differentiate these days largely on the base of software, right? I mean, when I go choose which refrigerator or which washing machine to buy, you know, software enters into the picture. You know, does it have a big old screen? Can I automatically order milk, you know, over Amazon Alexa without having to tell it? You know, all, all these kinds of cool things. But, you know, if you're a car company, you know, yeah, we've got a cool engine, but mm, does the Bluetooth connection work? You know, how's the sound system? You know, it's like all but car stuff uh, is, is, is important. And, and that's, you know, across kind of all sectors uh, of, of the industry. Uh, this is an interesting slide that I found. Um, it's basically, if you see in the middle there, it's kind of a, a, a snapshot of Wells Fargo's homepage. Uh, and, and here are the, I think it's like 90 something companies, startups, that are trying to you know, kind of disintegrate uh, or disrupt the finance industry, right? So there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities to do interesting things, you know, and be the next Uber, be the next Spotify, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Do, do something better, deliver better product faster uh, and charge your customers less, you know, that, that's kind of always a winning uh, a winning proposition. Uh, so there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on. And, you know, like I said, software, that's really the primary driver of a lot of these things and how we make decisions uh, based on that. So for, for a number of years, um, this, there's one question uh, that you can ask a software team or a release team or an ops team um, to, to sort of predict the performer, performance of, of that team. That's a very simple question. To what degree do we fear doing deployments or installations or releases or, you know, to, to what degree do we fear exposing our wonderful new stuff to the rest of the world, right? Uh, and, and, and the answer kind of historically is we fear that a lot, right? These are million dollar conference calls that go on for hours and hours and hours. And is this broken? Is that broken? Roll that back, roll this forward, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and and, and uh, the state of DevOps report, uh, which if you haven't read it, uh, is a really interesting read from the point of view of two things. One is they've been tracking these things now for a number of years and very rigorously analyzed a lot of data 
And uh, in, in the last, well, not the last, but actually 2016, 2017, uh, these are the numbers. And you know, just a couple of things that I want to point out. Like, we're not dealing here with sort of percentage differences between high-performing software organizations and less-performing software organizations. We're dealing with orders of magnitude, right? Way shorter lead times for organizations that do this stuff well. Way more frequent deployments, way faster recovery from failures when they do happen, way lower uh, change failure rates. And, and really what that shows up, you know, in, in terms of what's the, okay, great, that's nice, but here's the impact of that, right? People spend less time on unplanned work. You know, 20% of, of my week, that's like getting a whole new day, assuming I work five days a week, which I don't think probably most of us have done, you know, very much recently. But, um, and, and more time spent on new work, right? More time spent on innovation, functionality, features, instead of firefighting, you know, backfilling, uh, all of those kinds of stuff. And so there, there really is, and, and, and there's very solid data and very solid analysis based on tens of thousands of interviews and, and those kinds of things that, uh, that the uh, DevOps, uh, State of DevOps report had done, the, you know, Jez Humble, uh, Gene Kim, and, uh, and Dr. Nicole Forsgren have, have kind of, and a bunch of other people as well, have, have worked on this. So that's just a little bit of, you know, kind of setting the scene, right? But this was supposed to be about architecture, so I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so why is software architecture important? Um, Martin Fowler generally always does a wonderful job of defining things and writing about things, so then this is no exception. Uh, architecture is about the important stuff. And, and kind of the addendum I add to that is architecture is also about the stuff that's really difficult to change downstream, right? It's hard to make a bad architecture unsuck. Um, if you have a bad architecture, if you don't scale, if you can't recover from problems, if you can't deliver functionality, yada, 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 you know, you're, 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 you're in a world of hurt. Uh, competitively, if nothing else, right? Aside from having unhappy employees, unhappy customers, you know, your, your competitors are gonna eat your lunch. And um, sort of an apocryphal quote from, uh, uh, from Charles Darwin, I did a little bit of research on it and realized he never actually said exactly this, but you know, the point stands. You know, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, it's the one that's the most adaptable to change, right? And anybody that's worked in a startup knows that, you know, oh, 90 degree turn, you know, oh, that was a bad idea, let's try this, you know, so, so absolutely you have to do a lot of that. But we also have to do that in, in our software, you know, how we build it, how we deliver it, how we create it, how we support it, uh, all, all of those kinds of things. And, and to get a little bit more detailed even, um, a few years ago, um, we, um, Electric Cloud and, and IT Revolution co-founded the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, and once a year, we go up to Portland uh, for uh, what we call the DevOps Enterprise Forum, where basically all the speakers get together and we just kind of figure out you know, what's happening, what's going on. Two or three years ago, I, one of the things that came out of that was this paper called Measure Efficiency, Effectiveness, and Culture to Optimize DevOps Transformation. And, and the thing that I pull out of this to, to make a point is, you know, the, 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 quote, the pullout quote here, software's most important quality is its adaptiveness and ease of change. Right? That's kind of a simple statement, but it has broad implications, right? If you think about, you know, what if you wanted to rip out and replace a particular component in your application architecture? What does that involve? How free are you to do that? How scared or not scared are you of doing that? Um, are you able to do it? Are you allowed to do it? Um, is, is, is the culture at the company allow those things? Or if there are problems, does that mean you get yelled at and fired and blamed? And, you know, do we suppress innovation by, you know, by controlling for risk or appearing to control for risk? All of those kinds of things. So there's cultural aspects of that as well. But also just how easy is the code to change? How tied is the product to the way that we build it, the way we, that we test it, qualify it, you know, run, you know, regression, performance, security, all of those kinds of things. Um, and that's a big deal, right? Um, and then thinking about kind of architectural uh, outcomes, uh, this is, I think I stole this from Jez Humble. Um, the, you know, the idea is basically, you know, ask yourself some questions, right? Can I make large scale changes to the design of the system without the permission of someone outside the team? Well, you gotta work with the team, right? You don't wanna go totally rogue here, but nobody outside the team. Or being dependent on other teams, right? Do I have autonomy to build the thing the way that we think it should be built? Right? Or change it if it needs to be changed. Right? You know, can we complete our work without fine-grained detailed communication and coordination with people outside the team? Right? Can we deploy and release product or service on demand independent of other services 
uh, the product or service depends on. You know, can we do most of our testing on demand? You know, I don't have to read the rest of these to you. But, but the idea that's kind of coming up here is the idea of coupling, loose coupling, right? Um, anybody who's read uh, The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks uh, probably is familiar with what he wrote in there and also kind of his uh, use of, uh, you know, what's become known as Conway's Law. You know, if you, if you uh, build a software product or a product in general, uh, the structure of that product will reflect the communication um, layout of the team that built it. And put more concretely, um, if you want a four-phase compiler, have four different teams build the compiler, right? That's, that's what you'll get. You know, the, the structure of the team, the structure of the communication between the teams will be reflected in the architecture of, of, of the resulting product, right? And that means, and that, you know, Fred Brooks's conclusion for that is, you can't solve the problem by throwing more people at the problem if you're late, because that will just increase the amount of communication that has to happen, and you'll get less done, right? And really, the only thing you can do is kind of divide and conquer. And again, stealing from, from Jez Humble, loosely coupled architectures and teams are the strongest predictors of continuous delivery, right? So, so if everybody has to kind of go in lockstep, you know, if you've got 100 people responsible for, for a big product that's, you know, perhaps broken down into multiple components, but if everybody needs to kind of get in lockstep and you can't move unless everybody moves, then you don't have a lot of agility, and I'm kind of lower A agility, um, in the process. Right? You can't move forward very quickly. So what are, what are loosely coupled architectures? You know, what, what are they? What are they good for? Uh, those kinds of things. And I'm going to kind of contrast here you know, monolithic architectures versus you know, essentially microservices, because that's, that, that's, that, that's the most common way this uh, shows up. Now, there are some pros to the monolithic architecture, you know, sort of your traditional three-tier database, app server, web server you know, kind of approach where, you know, you, you, you build and deploy it. Now, they can be easier to develop, right? Because you don't have to sit down and figure out, well, what 50 different um, subcomponents or services do I have to come up with here? And how do I staff that? Um, they can be easier to test, you know? Because if I got to set up the system to do some integration or system testing, it's a monolith. So just boom, set it up, right? I don't have to have 50 different, uh, you know, computers or, or a huge Kubernetes cluster or any of these kinds of things. So. Um, you know, the, the net net of this is these pros aren't very pro, but, you know, I'm just trying to be balanced here. And they can be easier to deploy, right? I mean, if, you know, if it's just a big old war file, drop it into Tomcat or WebSphere or WebLogic or, you know, whatever you happen to use, and boom, you're done, right? You don't have to do orchestration or coordination or make sure all the pieces are available and there's a, you know, there's a, there's a name server so they can all connect to each other and all of these kinds of things. It, it can be quite a bit easier. But, you know, a lot easier to produce spaghetti code, harder to integrate new technologies because it's a monolith. And if I decide that the best job to solve this problem is you know, not Java or not Erlang or not JavaScript or whatever, I don't really have a choice because this is a monolithic architecture. So it's all got to be built kind of in the way that we built it. So you don't get to choose the best tool for the job always. Um, harder to learn and understand the code because you know, it's, it's war and peace. You, know? you got to read the whole thing end to end. Um, and, and the last two are kind of the killers, right? It's, if you got to scale anything, you have to scale everything. Right? And you don't always need to or even want to or are able to, to scale every single piece of a system, um, you know, either for technical reasons or for financial reasons. And you can't deploy anything until you deploy everything. Right? So there's no notion of, well, we got a team over here working on that, and when they're ready, they'll deploy it. You know, they'll deploy the fix. Uh, no, it's, well, what else is in there? Have we tested it? You know, are we ready to go? Or, you know, it gets much more complicated. Now, Microservices architectures, uh, loosely coupled architectures in general, is kind of more focused on a bunch of services communicating with each other, each service doing you know, one thing well. You know, I am the shopping cart service, or I am the, I'll feed you the avatar you know, ping uh, for the person that logged in, or you know, tons of uh, all, all kinds of different things, right? They're independently <laughs> developed, right? They're independently deployable. <coughs> which means you know, if there's a problem in one service, I can independently fix it and deploy it independent of everything else. Right? I don't have to wait for everybody else to kind of get in lockstep with the monolith and all that stuff. Typically, they expose an API. Right? You know, REST and HTTP and JSON and all those things are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty common, and they typically run in their own process. Right? So you don't have like 18 services running in one process or you know, those kinds of things. That's, that's, so that's pretty loosely coupled. Um, cool things about this, right? You can divide and conquer complex distributed applications, right? They're independently developed and deployed, 
So you can use containers for them, which is nice um, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and, and bottom left here is kind of important too. You can choose the right tool for the job, right? If, if Java is good for this, but JavaScript is good for that, and you know, we, want to use, we use native code for this, and we need a GPU over here to do some crunching, and you, know, you, you get to choose the right tool for the job. Um, and you get to change your mind, right? Because switching out the tooling or the infrastructure for one piece of a large application is easy to do if it's just a bunch of microservices that just talk to each other over the wire. Nobody will ever be the wise. You know, nobody knows you're a dog behind that you know, microservice, basically. Um, whereas with, you know, with, a, with a monolithic architecture, it's like, well, we wrote this one in Java. Uh, let's rewrite it all in Erlang. You know? See you in 10 years. You know? um, and, and this is kind of the, 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 the part where I, my, my, I think I've been playing so much with my cat in this laser, it doesn't really seem to work, but um, that's really what the, they're good for. Um, smaller, more autonomous teams are more productive, right? I mean, that is a, you know, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if we can call that sort of scientifically proven, but it's certainly empirically, you know, proven. Less communication, more autonomy, you know, do the job well, uh, keep doing it. Now, they're not a silver bullet, right? Because you can take your big old pile of crap and, Segment it out into smaller piles of crap. You still got a bunch of piles of crap, right? So it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, lots of organizations that I talk to, you know, seem to think that, oh yeah, you know, six months, we'll we'll just, you know, we'll take our, you know, 15-year-old application and we'll microservicize it. And I'm like, okay, um, you should have, you know, what 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 some people call the BHAG, you know, the big hairy ass goal. That's good. Have some vision, um, but you know, be realistic too, right? Um, you, you, you can't just sprinkle some microservice on your stuff at the end and say, well, boom, right? It's good. It doesn't come in a box. Um, so some best practices, if you're in the position where you got to decompose an existing monolithic architecture, and also some, you know, I, I, you know, there's a flip side to that too, which is some of these things are just kind of generally good ideas. Um, you got to figure out what you're going to be able to run as microservices, right? Look for seams that you can pull things out, you know, use the strangler pattern to start to, you know, kind of pull things off to the, to the side uh, so that they're independent of each other and, and you can start, you know, maybe you can pull out a particular piece of your monolith and run it separately or maybe you have a new piece of functionality that you need to add, you know, build that separately and, 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 and do those kinds of things. Uh, Domain-driven design tends to be fairly uh, useful in this, you know, expect to get this stuff wrong the first time and evolve. Um, you know, benchmark because performance is going to be important, right? You know, one of the things you're going to do here is you're going to go from an in-process call of a method or a function to an over-the-wire call, right? That, that, that has implications. That has latency implications. That has throughput implications. That has reliability implications, right? So you, those all need to get handled, right? So this is where we start to find out that, yeah, microservices are cool, but you got to get certain things right. And you don't necessarily have to worry about those as much in, in the monolith because, you know, that method call failing? No. I mean, if it fails, my process has already died, right? But if you're over the wire or somebody trips over a network cable, you know, that never happens, um, then you got to be able to be resilient to that, you know? Netflix has a bunch of uh, great libraries that they've open sourced for doing uh, some of these things, you know? Um, circuit breakers and retries and, and, and those kinds of things. So there are frameworks out there for helping uh, to, to do that. Um, and again, you know, Conway's law. Uh, whatever, whatever structure your teams have will almost certainly be reflected in, in, in the product when it comes out. The biggest problem, the biggest challenge people have, I would say, with, with decomposing existing monoliths is what do you do with the state? All of these things are super simple if you have, no, have read-only state. Right? If all you're doing is serving data, you, you, you've got so much less to worry about. Um, but if you're reading and writing data, uh, some, of which, some of which may be transactional, or, or at least you know, transactional in the nature of, I only want you to charge my credit card once, not twice, and not zero times, right? So there's some, you know, you need a little bit of you know, acid in there. Sprinkle a little bit of acid on that. Um, but you, know, you, also need, you can also start thinking about, you know, is eventual consistency okay for some of these things? You know, when I, when I, when I post a tweet, you know, does it matter if it shows up for him now and for him, for you, five seconds later, right? It's, that doesn't really matter, right? Five hours later might be a different story, but that's more about performance, right? So there are certain pieces of data and state that we deal with that don't need an RDBMS on, on the back end, right? So, so you know, dealing with messaging, 
event-based you know, kinds of things gets, gets, gets more prevalent and more useful. You know, do you need an RDBMS here? You know? um, for some things, maybe. For some things, maybe not. You know? so, so be smart about that. Um, there's a bunch of um, you know, kind of patterns that people are using uh, to start to decouple. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to kind of go all the way deeply into these. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sort of you know, skim over them a little bit. But there's a, there's a thing called a saga pattern. Uh, which is really about what I used to be able to do in a single commit transactionally, I no longer can because I've broken that, ser that thing up into multiple services. Each service owns its own data. One of them might store it in an RDBMS, the other one might store it in some key valve store somewhere, right? Um, so that means I have no foreign keys, I don't have joins that I can run, you know, those kinds of things. The implications are fairly, you know, drastic. Uh, if, if, you're a, if you're a heavy RDBMS user. Um, and so you start to need to do things like, you know, event-based mechanisms where, you know, we used to, you know, if I'm, if I'm uh, buying an airline ticket, right, uh, I pick my seat, I pick my flight, I pay, but a lot of different things have to happen for that to work right, you know? If, if, if my credit card gets declined, they gotta release the hold on the seat so that somebody else can buy it, um, you know, all, all of those kinds of things. And if you, if you, you know, traditionally in old architectures, you do that with some transaction coordinator or multi-phase commit, and, you know, basically everybody stands around, you know, till everything's ready and, and then you're good. But you can't do that. Now you're highly coupled, right? That is the opposite of a, of a loosely coupled system. So the saga pattern is just something where, you know, you can, you do one transaction here. So, you know, reserve the seat, reserve the plane, send an event forward, um, and then go charge the, the, the credit card. If that succeeds, you send another event and say, okay, now issue the ticket, right? If the credit card gets declined, you have to send another event because we have to go back and we have to unreserve the seat. So, you, so because you can't just do a rollback of a single transaction, you may in fact have to go do cleanup post, post, post facto. Um, so it is more complex. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that you gotta worry about. Command query responsibility is another thing that people use quite often uh, so that you kind of split out your reading and your writing effectively. Um, if you can do that, you know, then you can start to throw in all kinds of interesting, you know, caching and, you know, key val stores and all of those kinds of things. While perhaps, you know, for your writing type things, that goes through a different, a different channel. It needs to be more, you know, uh, uh, needs to be a little bit more acid uh, for those kinds of things. Um, event sourcing is another kind of interesting uh, idea. You know, the idea is basically you get rid of the database tables altogether, and instead you just have the log, you know, the database transaction log. And so if you want to know what the state of the world is at any point in time, go to the right place in the transaction log and, and you see it. Um, that's a big change, a big deal, uh, you know, very different way of looking at the world, but some people are doing it. Um, I think this example, if I remember right, is from Spotify, but basically, you know, the architecture that they have for, you know, their, their kind of their mobile uh, set up, they used to have a, a kind of a complicated architecture for doing this and they simplified it kind of a, a, a lot because they decided they were going to build out what they call a BFF, a back end for the front end, right? So, so the, the mobile apps all talk to this and this kind of translates into what has to happen on, on the back end. And, and there's a lot of reasons why those kinds of things are interesting, especially in IoT in the mobile space because they're not always on, they don't always have reliable TCP connections or even you know, UDP uh, capabilities. They might be on an airplane or switched off or in an area of bad reception. Um, so if you, can, you know, if you can push some of those kinds of things into a, kind of the back end for the front end, you don't have to go re-implement you know, all of that kind of crap in a mobile device where you have way less resources. And you know, a, a mobile browser is not the same as the browser on your laptop right? in, in terms of resource consumption and availability and, and all of those kinds of things. And of course, you know, Serverless types of things, uh, backend as a service, functions as a service, is going to kind of you know further kind of decompose you know our services into literally you know independent functions that you just call, and that function doesn't exist until you call it. It spins up very quickly, goes back down, and you know you pay per function call as opposed to paying per CPU hour, perhaps. Right? Um, some people, and there's been some funny exchanges about this over the years in terms of, you know, why is serverless and PaaS just not the same? You know, what's the difference between, you know, a container and, and a VM? And Adrian Kokoft had the, you know, kind of the, <laughs> the right metric here, which is you can call it whatever you want as long as it starts in 20 milliseconds, runs for half a second, and then goes back down. That's serverless, right? 
if, if I got a startup in Amazon AMI, which takes anywhere from, you know, some days 10 seconds and sometimes 10 minutes, just depending on stuff, right? Um, now, you, I'm sure you could pay Amazon a lot of money to make sure that it's always 10 seconds, but, you know, you may not want to do that. And, you know, a lot more questions about, you know, kind of serverless and all of those things. And I think, you know, the great question here in the bottom right is really just, okay, state. State is the difficult thing, you know. A friend of mine once said, and I don't know where the, who originally said it, but, you know, only two hard problems when you're writing software. You know, number one is naming, and number two is when to flush the cache. Right? Those are the two hard problems that we still all have to solve. And when we get those wrong, especially the latter one, bad things happen. Um, so, you know, a lot of serverless development is getting rid of ops people. No question, right? It's like, I don't want to run infrastructure. That's not my job. I don't have a power generation plant in my backyard. I buy power from PG&E, right? Um, I also don't have, you know, a data center anymore. I buy that from Amazon, Azure, you know, Google, whatever. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And we'll have to figure out how to do that. And I think somebody who asked a question, I don't really have a good answer for it, but it's okay. How is this different than stored procedures in terms of proliferation of stuff that nobody understands what that little piece does and nobody has a big picture, right? Oh, here's a stored procedure. It's been in the database for 10 years. Does anybody know who uses this, right? I mean, so there'll be a little bit of that, right? So. Uh, a little bit more about the kind of ar architecture and, you know, some things look, uh, look right, some things don't. Uh, monitoring, very important. Uh, this is one of my favorite tweets ever. If you don't follow the Honest Status page, it's kind of funny, or Honest Update. Um, we replaced our monolith with microservices so that every outage could be more like a murder mystery, right? One of the nice things about the monolith is when it breaks, there's really only one place to go look, right? Now, if you have 1,500 microservices running in the cloud on containers that come and go all the time, and something breaks, yeah, it's, you know, Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the, you know, in the drawing room. Uh, and you gotta figure that out, you know? So I'm not, I'm not endorsing any of these, you know, companies here. I'm just saying, look, you need to worry about this problem, right? Uh, especially if you're gonna go full on container, full on uh, microservices and so on, monitoring, logging, all of those things, you know? All services ought to log and emit monitoring data in a consistent fashion, right? No matter what implementation you choose to use for each service, you still want to be able to collect the right metrics and data uh, and so on, you know, aggregate them uh, so that everybody can get to it. I, honestly, when I, when I work with our customers, it's amazing how often it's, well, yeah, that's going to be in that log file, but I don't have access to that system, right? I, I don't have, for security reasons, right? I'm not saying, like, they're mean and don't give them access. It's more like he's a developer and, you know, segregation of uh, duties and Sarbanes-Oxley says thou shalt not touch production systems if you have, you know, developer tattooed on your forehead and vice versa. So, so things like correlation IDs become important, right? Because a, a customer request comes into the front end that may be serviced by 400 different services by the time it gets completed. If one of them goes wrong, you better be able to track all of those back to sort of what the original problem was. And, and hopefully do that before the customer calls and says, oh, by the way, you know, your product sucks, I hate it, and I'm gonna go use your competitor. Um, latency response time between services is, is, is key, right? Because theoretically, this would have all been in the big giant monolith, right? So it was a method call, which are free, uh, and it doesn't really matter how many arguments I pass, because we pass by reference, and you know, it's like that becomes different now. You know, if, I, if I'm trying to pass a, you know, one, megabyte large object that gets serialized into JSON, sent over the wire, only so I can look at one key and then send you that back. You know, you're wasting bandwidth, you're, you're creating latency and, and all of those kinds of things. That wasn't such a big deal in the monolithic architecture because it was a pass by reference, you know? I didn't have to, shuff, I didn't have to shuffle that megabyte, or megabyte around in the JVM or in, in, in the process space. Um, so, so, you know, you really have to, you know, pay attention to that. Um, and I just put this in because I love the picture, you know? Containers. Can you check the load balancer? <laughs> um, it's amazing. It's actually an amazingly difficult problem, as it turns out. This problem of how do you load containers onto a ship? I, my father worked in the in the business um, uh, when he was alive, and, and you know, and, and if you remember the El Faro, the ship that sank during the storm that was going from Jacksonville to Puerto Rico, that was part of the problem. It, it turns out, and they figured this out. It's kind of fascinating, actually. What what happened with that? I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but. Um, the containers on the foredeck, once the ship started sinking, smashed up into the superstructure and basically destroyed the, the navigation bridge. And so at that point, they were just screwed. I mean, they were screwed for all kinds of other reasons. They lost power and so on, but, you know, 
The fact that they were badly loaded then meant that these containers broke free and literally were like smashing into the bridge as they're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Just bad, bad news. Um, reads like a, you know, murder mystery novel. Um, very important thing, automated testing, right? You will not ever achieve velocity in terms of, you know, CI, CD, Agile, DevOps, Kanban, Scrum, whatever you want to call it, if you do manual testing. Manual testing is death to velocity, right? And it's also error prone and it's, yeah, we skip it because yeah, I tested, you know, three of them because the other ones don't seem relevant, you know? Um, so the, the kind of the, you know, the test pyramid here, right? You know, write a lot of unit tests, write fewer integration <laughs> tests, you know, very few system tests and automate the hell out of all of it. If anybody ever tells you we can't automate that, you should hear, I don't want to automate that. Half the time that's what people mean, the other half they mean I don't know how to automate that. Everything can be automated, you know. Um, if you're into uh, YouTube uh, stuff, uh, go look up uh, Simone Gertz. I think it's G-O-E-R-T-Z. Um, she builds robots, useless robots. Um, and automates a bunch of really funny stuff. And it's, you know, it's like, I point people to that to say, oh, you don't think you can automate that? Well, here it's done poorly, but it's been done. So, you know, shut up and automate, you know. Um, <laughs> so containers, just a little bit about that. Um, we've all latched onto containers for, for, for a number of reasons, right? Move the environment along, not just the code. Uh, so that when you get to test something, you're testing it the way it was intended to be run. Um, throw it into, um, uh, you know, throw it into, uh, you know, an orchestration engine, you know, Kubernetes, OpenShift, you know, all, you know, GC, all of those kinds of things. Well, those are all Kubernetes, but there's others. Um, and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you get a lot of nice things, like you can auto-scale things. Uh, you can, you know, you can hook things up the way you need to, and you get a lot of control o over things. And, you know, if, if, if he or she hasn't already, at some point your CFO will walk into your door or your office and say, you know, I heard that if we use containers, we can pack a lot more in than if we're using VMs and get better resource utilization out of my infrastructure. And that is, that is a cell number, you know, ZZ1234 on my spreadsheet of, you know, goodness and badness. Uh, that, that is my job to keep. So go use containers, please. You know, that, that, that'll happen. And for no other reason, right? Container orchestration, again, handles a lot of stuff for you. So those are good things, uh, very, very good things. Um, software pipeline. Um, you know, or, or as Gary Larson, one of my favorite cartoonists of all time, and it turns out he kind of accidentally became a cartoonist and then decided at one point arbitrarily, like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to do something else. And he did, so good for him. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody is around to hear it and it hits a mime, does anyone care? So with apologies to mimes, um, I still think that's funny. Um, so, you know, software delivery has changed, right? It used to be large app, few releases. Back when I worked in Macromedia in, in the 90s, you know, our product cycle was 18 months. Yeah, we did patch releases and, and that kind of stuff, but a major version of Director came out every 18 months, right? Very waterfall, although even at the time we were starting to do this thing we called Cyclone, where we had feature teams. So we had, you know, a, a QA person, an engineer, and a doc person individually working on, on a feature, and if it was ready to go and the release came, it went, and if not, we pushed it to, to the next one. So, you know, even back then we were starting to do this kind of stuff. And of course today it's, you know, uh, the other picture I use for this is from the, um, uh, from Fantasia, the, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse when he does the, when he, he needs to clean, and so he starts to clone the little, uh, uh, the little, um, uh, I was going to say brushes, but, you know, the brooms, and all of a sudden it goes crazy and nuts, and, you know, that's the other way to look at that. But here's the reality for most companies, especially if you're an existing company with existing product. You know, people like to use the word legacy for, for, for that. And, and I've decided, it, well, actually I've been influenced, but, but also decided I only, use wor I only use the word legacy to mean code that I can't test, right? That's truly legacy, right? Code that's been around and running for 30 years, that's awesome code, sort of by definition. Now you may not be able to test it and change it and evolve it, in which case it is really legacy code. But keep in mind, that's what's keeping the lights on and paying our paychecks and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I think we throw the word legacy around. And usually half the time when, when an engineer says legacy, they mean code I didn't write. That's, you know, if you, if you listen to them, that's really what they're saying. Um, but this is the reality, right, for, 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 a, lot of, for a lot of organizations. And um, another, another steal from Jez Humble, because he's so, you know, he doesn't mind that you steal stuff from him and he's so damn smart. Um, Gartner came up with this idea of bimodal IT. 
the new way of doing things and the old way of doing things, essentially. And as, as, as Jez says, you know, bimodal IT is a massive reductionist oversimplification, right? Because we're all, in, at least in large established companies, you know, we're running where we have, you know, we have our traditional apps, we, have, we may have some completely greenfield apps that are, you know, all new, um, and then we have hybrid. You know, we have a, you know, we have a large system, it's, it's transactional, it's backed by a mainframe, which yes, still exist and are still the right way to do some things, a lot of things, um, but that's got to interact with the mobile app. And we're kind of unhappy with our first iteration of the mobile app because <coughs> Wells Fargo, um, it's just a screen scraper, obviously, over some backend system that you don't control. And it looks like shit, it works like shit, uh, all of those kinds of things. It's much better now, so if you work for Wells Fargo, um, uh, don't take that the wrong way. Um, so, <laughs> but you know, no matter what architecture it is, you still gotta go through the process of building, qualifying, releasing, testing, deploying, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And oh, by the way, the destination for that stuff isn't like, you know, that rack in my data center. It's this availability zone, that availability zone. You know, we may be using multiple cloud providers. A lot, you know, some of our customers do that uh, to avoid lock-in, basically. They don't wanna, you know, they, they don't wanna kind of open their throats to Amazon and say, all right, uh, I trust you, you know, uh, don't, don't bite me. Um, but, um, you know, so, so, so that gets, you know, pretty complicated. And, you know, then we've got different pipelines that we need to manage, right? You know, you got your kind of commit pipeline, right? CI, you know, doing all the stuff, unit tests, you know, publishing the artifacts. You know, you might be doing some acceptance testing and, you know, part of that you might have to do some provisioning, right? You might have to fire this up in an environment that doesn't exist yet, right? A lot of, it's amazing how many organizations still are bottlenecked by the fact that they have only one of these environments, right? I, I, I can't test those changes because Bill is still using the test system, right? Singletons are bad, right? And environment singletons are even worse. And if they're snowflake singleton environments that you have no idea how to recreate from scratch, um, you're screwed, go home, you know, solve that problem. Um, but once you get some control over this, but then you've got this whole other thing, you know, sort of the release pipeline. All the stuff that happens after things leave development, after things leave QA, um, you know, probably we're gonna do a bunch more performance testing, regression, some of the lengthier testing stuff, right, that we don't wanna put into the CI uh, pipeline. Because the CI pipeline is there to serve developers, to give them fast feedback on whether they broke something or not. Uh, that's kind of a different problem you're trying to solve in, in, in the release. Uh, so, so they tend to, you know, end up with uh, uh, with a couple of pipelines. So I wanna leave you just with a little bit of uh, best practices. I think the title said 10 best practices. We squeezed them down to five for you, just for you. Uh, so <laughs> it is a discount. No, it's, no I'm, I'm charging you the same price, but I actually don't know how the 10 got in here because it was always five, but you know, an editing error, we'll call it. Um, artifact repo, it's amazing how many organizations still don't use binary artifact repos. They use the magic folder. You know, oh yeah, whenever the build finishes, it copies it up into there. Whenever release is done, they copy it into that folder. Okay, well, who else can read that? Who else can write to it? Uh, you know, uh, and how do you manage that? How do you version it? You know, if you have the magic folder and you have to roll back, if you overwrite the artifact from the last time you put it in the magic folder, did you copy and save the old, you know, version if you have to roll back during the, you know, artifact repositories are good. I don't. I don't think I have to tell most people this anymore. Hey, go ahead. Could be, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the, the notion really is, can I go back? Do I know what's where? Do I know the provenance of, you know? One of the things you have to do, especially when you start thinking in terms of regulation and governance and security and safety is, this is a supply chain, right? And, and if I'm, you know, if I'm making food, you know, if I sell bread, uh, I want to make sure that at no point in the process can somebody walk over and sprinkle something into the dough, you know, that isn't, you know, that you don't want a dough, like, you know, poison or something, right? Well, guess what? One of the largest attack vectors these days for software isn't once it's deployed, it's in the software supply chain, either by taking advantage of bugs in frameworks or libraries or maliciously injecting uh, stuff that can then be taken advantage of, of later. Uh, but this helps, anyway, artifact repos, if you can go back and forwards and you, you don't lose information and data, that's, you know, that's the problem you're trying to solve with that, really. Automated deployments, automated everything, right? We're now, we sell release automation software, so, you know, don't just trust me, but 
um, automate everything. Uh, humans are incredibly bad at rebooting the correct system from the correct X term at three in the morning when the boss is saying, is it fixed yet? We're losing $100,000 an hour. Is it fixed yet? Are we there yet? Um, oops, you know, that happens even at Amazon, right? S3 went down on the East Coast because somebody was troubleshooting and did the wrong thing. Now, if you're troubleshooting, you're troubleshooting, right? But, but still, right? Um, automate as much as possible. Um, Self-service is a really important concept as well. One of the biggest introduction of delays in the software pipeline is, well, I need an environment to do that in. I need to deploy the application to that kind of environment, and then I need to test against it. And one of our customers, this is a few years ago now, they've gotten a lot better, but um, when, when they, before they started doing virtualization, this is a massive pharmaceutical company, I'll, I'll say that. Um, when they first uh, started this stuff out and they had hardware, uh, the service level agreement for requesting a new environment, because it involved hardware, was 42 days. From the time you requested, from the time the approval was, the, the request was approved to the time you had the system was 42 days. They then switched to using virtualization. And the service level agreement after they virtualized was from the time that your request is approved to the time that you get your VM is 42 days, right? So, you know, yeah, great, they deployed the technology, but they kind of missed the point, I think. And, and, and as a result of that, what happened was lots and lots of public cloud usage under the covers, right? People take out their credit card and say, screw it, I'm going AWS, screw it, I'm going to Amazon or, or Azure or, you know, Google. Um, and, and that's sort of, that's frowned upon in regulated environments, let's put it that way. Um, Self-service, on the other hand, right? If you can pre, you know, because look, you go to a restaurant, you order off the menu, everybody's happy. If you're one of those people who are like, yeah, but I, can, can I get that, but with the sauce on the side? And then because I'm intolerant to, to people like you, um, I want to, you know, like that's going to take longer. Right? And, it, and, and so what, 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 what our customers are starting to do now is say, look, here are the 12 different patterns for how we do X, Y, or Z, how we stand up environments, how we set up a pipeline, all of these things. Put those in the self service catalog. Anybody needs one of those things? Click, boom, five minutes later, done. Right? No architecture review committees, no security committees, no SecOps, no any of that. It's pre-approved, right? You're ordering off the menu. If you need something that's different, Maybe that's a new thing, right? Maybe that's something we want on the menu. Or maybe it's not. Maybe you're just being an idiot the way you want to structure it, right? But the conversation comes about, why do you want to do things differently? Not about, let's spend an hour with some very expensive people in a room talking about how this is the same as the last time we did it so we don't have to worry. You know, make it the same by just automating it and making it the same, right? Um, Self-service environments, kind of a related thing to self-service in general, but this becomes one of the biggest weight points, right? Uh, we were just at a, another pharmaceutical company in uh, Northern Ireland, and they had done a value stream mapping, which if you don't know what that is, look it up, it's cool. Um, and so they had a huge whiteboard, I mean, it was easily this wide, post-it notes all over the place, kind of tracing what happens to their code as it leaves, you know, gets ready to leave. And in between every step of work, where you actually did something, was an orange, bright orange post-it note with the delay between the two steps. The amount of work added up to three weeks, the amount of delays added up to four months. So an order of magnitude more waiting than doing. And, and I, I, I did a webinar with, with Nicole Forsgren a few months ago and she had a great point of view on this. She says, we spend a lot of time thinking about what we do to our code, right? What are the boxes where we do stuff? We don't spend enough time waiting or thinking about what what happens to our code, the orange boxes. And honestly, what happens to our code a lot of the time is it sits in the corner, lonely, you know? It's work in progress inventory from a manufacturing perspective, untested, unintegrated, you know, those kinds of things. Um, Self-service environments are a great way to just take, take those delays out of, out of the system because they are, uh, they affect us, right? That we have less time to do the important things, we ship less quality, less functionality, or late, or, you know, all of those kinds of things. Security auditability, right? You can't, at the end of your cycle, sprinkle security or sprinkle performance on your app and then boom, you know? Just, oh, we ran out of security. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Costco. I'll be back in an hour, you know? 
No, that, obviously that's not how it works, but we still seem to treat it that way, right? Oh yeah, let's do some performance testing now that we're a week away from shipping, right? Because performance problems are always easy to solve. They're always trivial, right? It's always just one line of code we gotta fix. No, right? We all know that's not true. <laughs> the blockchain will solve everything, right? Um, I'm not gonna read these to you. Uh, if you're uh, interested in take a picture, I think they're gonna make the slides available too, but there's just a lot of things that you gotta sort of worry about if you wanna really maintain that velocity and, and, and really get to the point where, you know, somebody checks in a piece of code and it goes through all the stuff that it has to go through, including, if appropriate, going into production, right? 10 minutes, an hour, right? Um, and, and that's really where sort of that early stuff in the state of DevOps report comes from because for some organizations, from the time I commit code to when it's live for customers, whatever that means, is 15 minutes. For other customers, for that very same line of code that I changed, it's 15 weeks, right? I mean, that is, you know, one company will thrive and succeed uh, and one won't. I mean, it, it's really as simple as that, you know? And, and you, you know, so you kind of want to start to build these pipelines and, you know, build how you do things and make them repeatable and best practices. And, you know, if you've got a thousand different applications, you're a large, you know, financial institution or something like that, you can't have, you know, a snowflake process, a snowflake pipeline for everything. You have to have a little bit of regularity or it's just chaos. Uh, so, so thinking about those, uh, those kinds of things. There's another thing just, you know, basically these are the other presentations I stole all my content from. That's, you know, kind of what it comes down to. <laughs> Credit where credit is due, as, as, as they say. Um, so, um, one only commercial plug. If you wanna play around with our product, you can go download it for free on the website uh, and, and do some of this stuff. Q&A, we've got a minute and 32 seconds, which is usually more than I end up with at the end. So if you guys have any questions, happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for, uh, for coming and listening. <laughs>